Okay, so I've thought a lot about this, and here's what I've decided. If you're not a fan of Andor or the way it chose to tell its story, then what I'm about to say won't change your mind. If you did, however, appreciate this slow burn and deep character drama, then what you will hear through the course of this review may resonate with you in a way you weren't expecting. And for that, you are this video's target audience. Spoilers, of course. With all that out of the way, here we go. Is that the best you got? How long we hang on, how far we get, how many of us make it out, all of that is now up to us. To describe the story of Andor as the backstory of a rebel would be somewhat like describing the Odyssey as the story of a boat ride, or Death Stranding as the story of a delivery man, or the Sistine Chapel as the story of a painting very far up. It omits the complexities, the layering, the nuance of the experience, and reduces it to its barest narrative bones. It is easier to review and break down art when it lacks the brushstrokes that make it such, because real art is not only experienced, but extracted, remembered, relatable, revered, and inspiring. When a substance grows so human that its themes become self-sustaining, that it effortlessly reignites itself at the forefront of your imagination, when how you see the world is providentially impacted by the medium of sound and perspective and the collision of consonants, you know you've created something special, and why reviews like this are so daunting. Perhaps the greatest accomplishment of art is how it balances the rhetorical examination of the human condition, even for those who maybe wished for something less subversive. What Andor's 12-episode run does along that balance for a seemingly pedestrian main character is layer the narrative investment horizontally and frequently. It's not until you're reminded of the harrowing tapestry surrounding you that you're fully aware of its greater accomplishment. It becomes impossible to not fall into that overwhelming cacophony of vision to surrender to its serendipity, because Andor is, without hesitation, Disney's greatest gift. A staggering, unyielding masterpiece. Kill me. Or take me in. In order for such a series as this to exist, it needs a character to be our eyes on the ground, and Cassian Andor has masterfully fulfilled that role more than many of us were ever expecting. On the surface, Andor is unremarkable, yet it wasn't about telling a story about him, but through him. Cassian is used as an anchor for other people's griefs. Luthen's angst, Mon Mothma's fears, Bix's pains, B2's struggles, Marva's sacrifice, Dedra's determination, Cyril's insanity, Nemec's hopes, Kino's realizations, all of these characters are evolved through the use of Cassian as a refracting lens. Cassian may seem one note to the song of others, but his job was never to be the leader. It was to inspire others to lead, and that complexity and that choice enhanced his own character's shell as an osmosis of story. One that, again, is an anchor for the development of others, and through their progressions, the common denominator is still Cassian Andor, still his resiliency, and still his eyes that align everything into frame. We use him as an emotional anchor to tell a story about the continuity of others, and that is such an awesome way to tell a story. Luthen Rael has quickly become one of my favorite people in all of Star Wars. The Empire is treated with the same level of respect and care and fear as it was during the original trilogy. Mon Mothma is one of the most captivating characters we've ever seen. Dedra is pure evil. B2 Emo is given a serious role where he can shine and break the mold of droids to sell toys. The attention to detail in every scene and set and character and word is just too much to put in one review. The moment I begin to hone in on one thing, all I'm thinking about is everything else. To give a small insight into the brilliance of the quiet of Andor and the message it provides, look no further than when Andor arrives on Narkina 5 and succumbs to the reality of his situation. But instead of fighting it immediately or throwing away a dumb quippy line, the show takes its time to sit in their reality, to contemplate and accept the situation, and to do the only human thing you can. Accept it, adapt to it, survive it, but get to work. It's moments like this where the focal point of the scene is clear, but Andor instead decides to show us the details on the fringe. What makes the scene feel unnerving is when the story knows it's time to simply listen and digest a situation, giving your emotions the credence they need to fill in the gaps and earn that investment. 
It was never about big cliffhangers or massive showdowns with Andor. It was about telling a story that matters with people that matter even more, in a way that shows the very best and worst of what it means to be alive. This is one of the best TV series I have ever seen. This is the best a Star Wars project has ever been. This is the best thing Disney has produced in the modern era. This is the quintessential Star Wars experience. There is no show that compares to this. Star Wars, when truly understood, is like poetry. It rhymes. Andor is not a story. First and foremost, let's just get that out of the way. Andor is a perspective. Andor is a state of mind. Andor is a moment of being. Visually, what we have here pushes Star Wars into a touch of thematic vividness that even George Lucas likely spent days dreaming about when the technology of his era was simply not enough. What Andor accomplishes in just one hour every week through a commitment of polish and endemic understanding is nothing short of genius. It retroactively enhances the artistic contrast of its universe and, without trying, highlights the glaring disparity between the level of storytelling that preceded it. In my own eyes, what was an already disappointing manifestation of Star Wars in the Book of Boba Fett and Obi-Wan Kenobi is now so laughably amateur that every ounce of their storytelling and sound design and dialogue and narrative presentation and cinematography and storyboarding and understanding of the essence of what makes Star Wars Star Wars? should be locked away and forgotten. Now, I'm not saying every show needs to be in Andor's tone. Far from that. This is, please. What I am saying is Andor accomplishes a pedigree of cinematic and structural evolution not seen since Rogue One, raising the bar of visual storytelling and nuanced character work inside of this world. This was an evolution I begged for repeatedly, even in prior videos, and finally we have it. The reason I'm putting so much emphasis into the writing is because I feel it's time for Star Wars to set a new bar for itself. Something that hasn't really been done in live action since Rogue One. I've seen so many takes from other YouTubers about how Andor doesn't feel like traditional Star Wars. And I am never one to call out others. That's not who I am. That's not what I do. And I don't even have 10,000 subscribers, but I have no idea what they're talking about. There is nothing here except authentic, traditional Star Wars in every iota of every scene and shot in this series. What Andor accomplishes that no other project has even come close to is reintroduce the feeling I first had as a kid watching the original trilogy. I didn't know entirely what the politics were about, I didn't fully comprehend the world and the complexities of it, but I believed it all because no one was on a narrative pedestal and everything was earned. I believed it all because the trident of Star Wars storytelling, spectacle, action, and message were so bold and vibrant that I was sucked in. I believed the actors in their progressions, I believed the world and its natures, I believed the heroes in their reasonings, I believed the empire and its legitimacy, and above all, I believed the world that existed because it was treated seriously by everyone involved. That feeling of authentic, slow-churn storytelling that simply gives a damn about what it's doing and what it's saying has eluded me since those days. It has escaped me since Rogue One, and yet, somehow, this series shot me back to a time when Star Wars wasn't a joke. I, again, was a young kid feeling like I was experiencing a universe so rich and so important for the first time, where the stakes mattered and the people did too. Andor felt like the natural next step in George Lucas's original vision, and that, my friends, is fantasy in its highest forms, and my god, is it art. I am in awe of the staggering accomplishment that Andor strove to provide in one of the most pivotal and tumultuous eras of Star Wars culture. A lesson about the human condition where everything played out the way you expected it to, but the twists along the way were subtle and written with attention to the details. It felt inevitable and full of purpose. That is why it worked. No one changes the world alone, and no one doesn't change it at all. But what you become at the cost of your mission is all that speaks when no one's left to listen. So, what does it look like to build a rebellion? What does it really look like? Not the war of it all, but the toll it takes. Andor asks you sit in the silence to listen and breathe, and then the answer comes.
What Andor does that so many interpretations fail to do is texturize the world of Star Wars. Rather than the glossy, coloring book nature of its counterparts, Star Wars here exists graphically, entirely three-dimensional and oozing of cohesive identities. Each new environment and perspective and discovery is given air to be taken in the same way it would in real life, with quiet contemplation and appreciation. Layered atop of all this silence is a story about the costs of climbing. The internal logic is set, the characters play their parts, and the rules of the stage aren't broken. Fight scenes are clever and smartly structured, conversations are nuanced and written with a poised friction, the politics takes the theater of the prequels and the tones of the original trilogy and mashes it together into something more. Scenes are given room to breathe and exist independently of the plot, and the plot is one of the best origin tales I have ever had the pleasure of viewing. Andor is the most quiet and thoughtful expression of Star Wars I never knew I needed but will forever be in debt to. There is not a wasted shot, a wasted moment, a wasted line of dialogue, nor a wasted interaction. Every step is a considered one. There is no absence of mind, just a level of confidence in storytelling most only dream about. Every second of this show has something important to say. Whether you're listening or not is up to you. But if you are, you are simply a fly on the wall of something grand and overwhelming as the world keeps its pace moving with the tension of a thousand coiled strings. The budget spared no expense, the world is so immense, and the canvas it dances on punches back, in a way I never thought possible for this franchise. A visceral, violent, and necessary evolution unlike anything before. Acoustically, Andor's sounds and music are rivaled only by the original saga. The music is transportive and used in a way that every decision from Andor to Mon Mothma feels like an avalanche of anxiety is about to suffocate you if the next scene doesn't begin immediately. This is the best a Star Wars score has been since the prequels, further enhancing the most dramatic of chases, the loudest of fight scenes, and the quietest of contemplations. Visually, Andor has no rival. It's not a hyperbole to say that the cinematography of Andor wipes the slate with what we thought was possible for dramatic storytelling in a TV series. Foot soldiers carry such unsuspecting instability, while the gravitas of the Empire's sprawling fingertips reinforces the cohesion between atmosphere and definition. The argument that this show only works because no legacy characters are running the ship is so asinine and completely out of left field. This show works because it has the best written characters and dialogue of any Star Wars media ever created on this earth. Obi-Wan Kenobi failed because its writing was pathetic and or succeeds because its writing is outstanding. From quips to conversations to situational logic to monologues to pathos to perspective to building upon the framework of every character, this is the best dialogue ever put in Star Wars making it far and away the greatest interpretation of Star Wars since Empire Strikes Back. Legacy characters have failed because they weren't treated with the same level of respect or nuance as every character in this show, and this layer of polish, from design to implementation to execution, has never, never existed before inside this world, and we should celebrate that triumph when possible. A world that feels so palpably authentic with analog technology that science fiction fans in the 50s would likely conjure up when asked what the future looked like. The set pieces from the warehouse shootout to the Eye of Aldani to that labyrinth of a prison system that brings a shade of evil to the Empire we haven't seen since A New Hope is all the necessary icing atop this thesis-level narrative cake. To say nothing of the story that pulses beneath every set piece as the heart of a competent, compelling, and mature perspective on this wondrous world. Politics, war, sacrifice, action, speeches, environments, it's all so damn good all the damn time. I just can't stop thinking about everything this show is. Tony Gilroy presents his universe as a forest. Andor asks you to accept that the forest exists independently of the trees, that it exists in spite of those trees, and no matter how many trees that rise or fall, the forest is still the forest. Each tree can operate as loudly or quietly as it wishes, and every leaf on every branch of every tree is a pocket of canonical soup with layers of broth to plunge your spoon into. It isn't until you cut down a tree that you see its rings, and these rings recount the passage of time. These rings tell age and maturity. What does it mean to then bring those rings to the surface, to see their marks day after day after day? What does it mean to take a hammer to them and strike them so forcefully so unapologetically, that you can't help but watch these rings expand where even their own expanse begins to corrupt the overpacked roots. Now, take that understanding, and if you choose to accept it, I want you to look at the individual trees in this forest and follow them. What do you see? 
Is it a perspective on causality? Is it the unnoticed underlings that convene carefully out of the corner of every crevice as a complex shadow rolls over the branches of this world? How do you define the condition of humanity when stripped of it? And how do you tell that story visually, narratively, thematically, tonally, and canonically? And or does it? And as always, thanks for watching.